We have such a good Father who loves us and provides for us and speaks to us and covers our life. It's just amazing how faithful God is to all the things that that we need and all the things we need for him to do in our life and all the things that he speaks to us. Hopefully you've been hearing the Lord speak to you. I hope you have in the book of Philippians so far. I'm just trying to kind of get you warmed up a little bit to uh, studying a book. A little bit different than just individual messages that come. Of course, I do a lot of series and they're very similar to books, uh, except they don't go verse by verse. They just kind of go concept by concept, and um, and then we adjust the scripture to to uh, what it is that the Lord's laid in our heart, and we share that part of the scripture, and so it's just a little bit different kind of flow of the way things go. But in a book, you know, obviously you just hit what comes next, and uh, and it allows a lot of great things. I think I think it allows you to really get into a lot of things that you wouldn't normally get into if it wasn't really the next verse or two in there. And um, it keeps, it, hopefully it keeps everybody from feeling like, oh, pastor's preaching to me today. He just knew, you know. Well, first place, I don't really do that because I don't really know anything about most of you other than what I see at church or at some uh, outing that we have together. I mean, I do know a few of you pretty close and, uh, and all of that. But, but most of you, you know, you're our church folks and we come to church together and uh, nobody talks about you. I don't know. You know, we, when I used to pastor churches, you know, in some places, boy, everybody talked about everybody. And I, you know, you could pretty much keep up with what was going on in people's lives. But I'm going to tell you, this is a pretty tight-lipped bunch down here. I guarantee you, no, I don't say anything about anybody. I mean, it's really it's amazing. Well, maybe it's because we don't all live in the same place either. You know, that might be helpful to us that, uh, you know, you guys are so spread out everywhere for those who might just be watching us and aren't familiar with our area and our church. Uh, goodness, man, it's kind of, it's almost like a regional kind of thing. I mean, good night. Kevin and Maritza live over there in Bay St. Louis, and, you know, that's a pretty good bit away. And, uh, and some of you live in Biloxi and Ocean Springs, and then others of you live, you know, up in the country in Socher. I, I think Kyle and them, our youth minister, boy, they live almost, I don't know where you'd call that, but it's like somewhere, it's <laughs> somewhere. Uh, is it Socher, really? Is that, is it Socher? Uh, yeah, Socher, yeah, Socher. Uh, <laughs> oh, but it's fun. But anyway, uh, hopefully you've gotten some things going in Philippians. We've had a couple of messages. One is, uh, you remember the first message was basically dealing with uh, other people in your life, how to enjoy people in your life. And it encouraged you if you're going to enjoy other people, you're going to have to look at them for the good that goes on in their life and the fact that God's not finished with them yet. And that they may not be everything they ought to be, but they're way better than they were. And you're going to have to love them, you know, with your heart and, and, and know that uh, the same God that's working on you is working on them. And uh, if you're going to enjoy other people, you're just going to have to move past a lot of very critical type things that we could get stuck on. Last week, uh, from the last part of the first chapter, I shared with you about how to be joyful no matter what. And to be joyful no matter what in your life is a really big statement because that no matter what is a big thing a lot of times, right? I mean, you know, no matter, when everything's good, boy, anybody can be happy and joyful. When the bills are paid, the job's going good, the family's running fine, the children are smart in school, and there's no conflicts and stuff like that. Who, I mean, who couldn't be joyful when, when that's going on? But what about most of the time? Because most of the time, it's not like that, is it? Most of the time, it's, it's, all, it's something. And... Um, and so if you're going to be joyful in those times, which the book of Philippians is all about joy, really, that's what we've titled it, the joy book. Uh, it tells us how to be joyful in life. And Paul's writing this from prison, in case you think he's in some ivory tower somewhere, uh, you know, uh, drinking sweet milk or something and, and just, you know, and, and, uh, and just trying to tell us how to live our lives when everything's going perfect for him. I'll just remind you that he was in a prison when he wrote Philippians, chained between two guards, waiting to have his head removed for whatever crimes might have happened in his life. Trumped up charges is really what it boils. And that'll make you bitter. Is there any of you, I would say, I'm not talking about necessarily jail, right here, but have any of you ever been accused of things you didn't do? 
Yeah, I mean, I know everybody's, you know, been accused of stuff you did do, but I mean, I'm talking about, like, have you really ever been accused of something you really didn't do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know how bitter it can make you when people yeah. don't believe that. Yeah. No matter what you say, they just start, oh, yeah, well, yeah, we know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and you can tell they're not, they're not receiving your report, but you're completely innocent. Well, imagine if you were in prison because of this and that your life was about to be taken because of this. That could really, you know, I mean, how to be joyful no matter what all of a sudden, sudden takes a whole different view of life. So he said, you know, if you're going to be joyful no matter what, you've got to change your perspective. You've got to see things differently. You've got you to choose to look at things in a certain way and, and, stop, and stop looking in the negative types of way. You've you got, you got to prioritize your life and say, okay, what's important and what's not important and start living by what's important in life and recognize the power of the Holy Spirit and that God's given you a purpose. I mean, you, you remember all these things. But anyway, those are, those are some powerful lessons, I believe, from the book of Philippians. Today... We get to jump right in the second chapter, first eight verses or so, and Paul's telling us how to reduce conflict with others, how to live uh, without conflict with other people in our life. And this is good word for us because it's very difficult to live without conflict with other people in life. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's pert near impossible, really, to live without some kind of conflict with other people. And, and I want you to notice on the top of your outline that it says, it says how, can we, how can we reduce conflict with others? I didn't say how can we eliminate it because it's impossible, I think, to eliminate totally the conflict. You know why? Because we're all so different, right? We have different personalities. We have different uh, objectives in life. We have different thoughts about things. I mean, my goodness, uh, guys or, or, or ladies, the difference between you and your husband or you and your wife is, is enough to be, to be in conflict at all times. Matter of fact, I've seen lots of families where mom and dad seem to be constantly in conflict with each other. Rather than complimenting, rather than uh, elevating each other, they are actually in conflict with each other. They're battling each other, and it's life's a battle with the kids, you know, and all this stuff like that. And so the Apostle Paul, led by the Holy Spirit, says, um, you know, life is not intended to be lived in conflict with other people. And so if you're going to live life without being totally conflicted with others, there has, to be some, there has to be some lessons in that. There has to be some ways of, of doing this because for the most part, we have to get along with each other. And the reason why is because very little in life is done completely by yourself. I mean, think about your life. What is it that's happened in your life that you have done completely by yourself? What have you accomplished in life? What is life all about for you if you're completely by yourself? No, no, no. Life's not made that way. God didn't make us that way. God create, created us human beings, I think, to be dependent beings. You know, We're dependent on him and we're interdependent on each other. God didn't make us to be alone. Now, I know that some of you may be sitting here and maybe some of you guys that are on the internet with us, uh, you're thinking, man, I love to be alone. I'd like to be right by myself. Matter of fact, I can think of one person right now in my mind that I, I know is probably watching us right now, and he's completely by himself, and he loves to hermit himself away. But I'm just telling you that that doesn't last forever. Sooner or later, there's going to be a break, and you're going to need somebody. I know a lot of times people come to church, and they sit in the back, or they sit somewhere isolated from everybody else, and they really don't want anybody to bother them, and they don't go and talk to anybody. And they, you know, they really act like that, hey, you know, I just came to church, and I'd really like it if you didn't bother me, and I'm just here to hear the message and just go on and like, you know, and, and, and be a loner, you know, and be antisocial and anti-people. Uh, but, but may I say to you that that won't last forever. There will come a time sooner or later where you do want people in your life, where you're going to need people in your life because you're not always going to feel like you feel now. You're not always going to be like you are now. And there are going to be some things in your life where you feel, you feel, uh, very much 
like you need to talk to somebody about something or you need some help with something or, or somebody needs to speak something in your life that will break this, this craziness and this, you know, this, 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 this hold that depression or whatever has on your life. So God knows that he created us to be together and that we're going to want to be together. That's why he puts us together in a church, by the way. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but God puts us together in a church. I know that you're sitting here and you're going, well, no, I decided to come to this church. Well, yeah, you did, uh, but you were influenced. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about that neighbor that invited you or that person in your life that invited you. Yeah. I'm telling you that you were influenced because I know we've had thousands of people, and I say that, maybe not thousands, that's not a good word, but certainly we've had probably a couple of hundred people for sure. And I mean, a couple of hundred people is not a small number. A couple of hundred people that have come into our church, uh, stayed here a, a week or two, uh, looking at churches, looking for churches, you know, they move into the area or they change and, and they're trying to check it out and see what, you know, if they like it or if it's going to meet their need or whatever expectations they have or whatever's important to them. And, uh, and they're not here uh, because this was not for them. Right, right. And then there are others of you that are sitting here going, how could this church not be for them? Right, right. This church is man for everybody. Yep. What else would you want in a church? We have a great praise team, a great band. Yeah. The pastor's phenomenal. I mean, come on. My, <laughs> what else could you want? <laughs> Thank you for that small spattering of claps. That's a, <laughs> at least I got something out of it. <clears throat> but anyway, yeah, I don't want to get the big head. But anyway, uh, you know, you're, and, and the reason you feel this way is because this is your church, yes. and I am your pastor. Right. And when I say things, it goes straight to your heart. Yeah. And I mean, other people can say things, and, and there are other wonderful, great pastors and Bible teachers and preachers. I mean, they, we're blessed as a land to have just some great men of God. Not anything negative about them at all in any way. It's just yeah. the fact that God has a shepherd for you and a church for you and a church family for you. And he calls you to that. And when you're there, you're happy. And when your pastor speaks, it goes straight in you and it matters. It makes a difference. It, it, it just doesn't go in one ear and out the other. It kind of, it lingers in there and rattles around in you. And God uses it to speak to you. And, um, and pretty much whatever happens at church that you're called to is great with you, you know? I look at Belvin Lawrence over here. They're from Chicago. Now, they're from Black Church, Chicago. They lived in a black neighborhood. They, lived in, they went to a black church all their life. Purely cultural, everything to do with, with and I don't know if many of you know this, but, but black church and white church are really different. Um, yeah. There are a lot of different ways it functions and acts and all that, and that's nothing racial. It's just a culture, and it's just culture. And, and, and so they come down here, and they come to a white church for the first time in their life. Yeah. I mean, they walk into a white church that does things in a white church way. Yeah. We sing white church songs. We, yeah. we, we preach white church sermons. Yeah. Um, we have announcements like white church does, yeah. you know, everything. I mean, totally everything. And, uh, of course, they've been with, with us now. Uh, yeah. to, how many years have we been? 13 years we've kind of been together. And, uh, and, and then we've had Freedom River for 10 years. So they've been here, you know, all the time with us. Yeah. And they've had to go through a lot of changes. I'm serious. I mean, you know, like music. They like that, they like that gospel, uh, black gospel feel, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, that kind of style of music that you've heard. And that, our music's nothing like that, you know, at all. Every once in a while we might sing one song or two that's kind of has a little, little taste of flow of, of that. But for the most part, you know, it's just praise and worship and stuff. And, and some of you, you know, you're from churches with, that sang hymns. You grew up singing hymns all of your life. And uh, to you to come to church and hear a band playing and they're singing, you know, Good, Good Father or, or, or any of the songs, any of the praise and worship, it's not a hymn. And, you, and that's, that's weird to you. You know, it's like, man, I, I miss my hymns and stuff. But if this is your church, you get used to it. And I guarantee you get used to it. And now you walk around humming those things. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you get used to it, and it becomes part of your life. Why? Because this is where God puts you, and God, 
gives you a love for it and a, and, and, and a heart open to whatever he wants to do through that group of people. And I'm just saying to you that don't feel like the Lone Ranger, uh, even if right now at the moment you might be a little isolated or you might feel like, okay, well, I don't really want people bother me. Uh, sooner or later you will. And God puts you with a group of people that he's called you to. And God has us as a family and a purpose for us. Uh, we're all gifted in certain ways. We all have certain attributes. We have certain talents, certain abilities, uh, all kinds of personality deals. Now, all of those areas that I just mentioned can cause conflict in life when they butt up against each other. And given enough time, they will butt up against each other. So the Apostle Paul says, all right, let me share with you Philippian church. This is a letter to a church at Philippi, the letter of Philippians. He says, let me share with you uh, some things that I think are really important. Let me tell you what we're aiming for first. And he spends the first two verses saying, this is what we're after, all right? Therefore, verse 1, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. Any of you have any encouragement for being united with Christ? Yeah, I'm encouraged by being with Jesus. I don't know about you. Thank God I'm with Jesus because life would be horrible without Christ. So we're all, we're all comforted. We're all encouraged from being with Christ. If there's any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if there's any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in the spirit and of one mind. So the Apostle Paul says, all right, here's what we're after. Here's what I'm about to tell you about. I, we need to be in unity with each other. Yeah, yeah. And as a matter of fact, he describes the type of unity in verse 2. He says like four things there. He says, first of all, make my joy complete by being like-minded. Like-minded means we think the same thing. When we think, we have the same thoughts about things. We have the same uh, understandings about things. We have the same ideas about things. Now, now, it doesn't mean that we all exactly, you know, are perfectly uh, like-minded in every little detail of life, but especially even in the big things, that we, all, that we all believe the same things. In Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, it is just vitally important that every one of you not only speak the same thing, but that you all believe the same thing. Because unity is a tremendously powerful tool that God has, and disunity is a terrible uh, weapon against things that, that, uh, that love is the center of, like your family and like a church, the church you belong to. It's very destructive to be disunified and to have a division going on in the church because somebody thinks one way and somebody thinks another, and we ought to do that, and then no, we're going in that direction, and we're going. In other words, Paul says, all right, if any of this stuff is true about Jesus, I, I, I want you, when I hear about you, I want to be happy when I hear about you because one of the reports about you is that you all have the same thoughts. You, you, you're like-minded. And then he said, also having the same love. So we're also looking for a group that, has, that loves each other, that cares about each other. And it's not wopsided and it's love for each other. Like half the people in the church are really loving and the other half are really takers in life. God intends for us to have the same love. Now, I will tell you one thing that I think makes this church a great church. Besides the fact that I'm the pastor, but I mean, you know, uh, I mean, what makes this church a great church? Uh, it, uh, right, <laughs> right. Uh, I know I'm pretty sure he said something different than that. But why, what, 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 what is it that makes this church a great church? Well, it, I think it is that we all do love each other. Now, like I said before, I don't know everything about you. I mean, I'm your pastor, but I don't know every detail of your life. And I'm not sure you would want me to know every detail of your life. <laughs> right. Right. Just as I wouldn't want you to know every detail of my life. Uh, but what I do know, I love. 
And I think we love each other. And, and one of the reasons why this church works like it works is because uh, out of love, we don't trample on each other. Right. Out of love, we don't do things, we don't say things, we don't go there. Because we respect and we say, look, that's not important. What's important is I love you. You're a part of my family and come on in and let's worship the Lord. And a lot of other little trivialities and little things that divide and split people and make people you know, feel isolated and like they're not a part. They're, that doesn't crop up because you have the same love for each other. And then he also says, hey, uh, being one in the spirit. That just simply means that... that that we are all headed in the same direction, led by the Spirit of God. That we're not, you know, we're not exemplifying different ideas about God and the workings of God and the Spirit of God and the direction of God and the heart of God and what God would have us to do and where God would have us to go. It means we're all led by the same Spirit. That we all believe in the same Spirit. We're led by the same Spirit of God. We're all together, forward march. You know, God's, God's leading us. And then the last thing he says is and that we be of one mind. Now, one mind just simply means we have the same purpose. Yeah. Uh, you'd be shocked how many groups of people and how many churches don't have the same purpose. I mean, one of them has the purpose of being one way and, and exalting this, and then the other one says, well, no, our purpose is to be this, and they want to lead in that direction. And so you have splits and schisms in the church, and you have people going in one direction, and some follow that direction, and others follow that direction, and then you have big church splits where people say, we can't be a church anymore. We're going to go be our own church, you know, and, and it's just a terrible thing. So the Apostle Paul says, all right, that's what we're aiming at. We're aiming at. What I'm about to tell you, these, these, these five things that I'm about to tell you in these next few verses, that's what we're aiming at. Okay. That's why I'm saying this to you, that you would become like-minded, that you would have the same love, that you would be of one spirit, and that you would be of one mind, one purpose. And so here they go. Number one, if we're going to reduce conflict with people in our life, and we're all going to be like-minded and have one heart and have one mind and have one purpose and one direction, then here, here are the imperatives that you have to have. Number one, diffuse competition. Yeah. Now, competition is caused, and, and, and the little subtitle I put up there, it, it just gives you an idea of what causes the division here. When, when we have competition in our families, it causes conflict. And competition is created by competing desires. Yeah, yeah. When we have competing desires in a family or a church or a business place or a group of people that are together, then we have conflict. Now, you parents are aware of this, I'm sure, if you have more than one child. I, I, I don't think I've said this to you before, but if you don't have more than one child, I'm not sure that you qualify to be a parent. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. And everybody's going, everybody's going, everybody's going, oh, pastor, you're so mean. Well, you all know how mean I really am. But, but the point about that is if you only have one child, you miss so much of parenting oh, yeah. because if something's broken, you know who did it, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, you miss that part where you look and you say, son, did you break that? No, sir. Uh, Amy did. You know, and then, Amy, what did you break that? Daddy, I didn't have anything to do it. Justin was playing with it. You know, you miss all of that. Who's right kind of stuff. This one and that one. And, and, and you miss all the competition and comparison. Like when you put some juice up on the table at, at mealtime, uh, looking at the, at the glasses, you know, make sure there's the exact level of, of juice in there. Oh, he got more than me or she got, you know. I mean, you just miss so much stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. Mama, tell Justin looking at me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he touched me, Mama. Uh, I mean, you miss all of that nice parenting stuff like that. If you're a single, if you have a single child, I mean, it's basically you and the child, and it's uh, you know, just a lot of things that you miss in there. But but anyway, my point is, if you have more than one child, you have seen competition in your family. Because you see all of the ways that each child uh, demands certain things in, 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 in their being of the family. 
Uh, they all want to be special. They all want to be. I mean, you know, there, there are children that always, that, watch me, Daddy. Watch me, Daddy. Watch this, Daddy. Go to that. Um, and, and we do that all of our life. Why? Because we want to be special. We want to be unique. We want to be well thought of. We want to be uh, the, the center of life. And that, that's just humanity. That's just human beings. And if you don't believe it, just look at a baby. The baby comes here focused on what? Itself. Me, 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 me. When you sit down, feed me. When you get up, take care of me. When you, I mean, it's just, and it's a constant, it's a constant struggle for superiority in life. As a matter of fact, the verse that is used is verse 3, and it says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, the old original King James language, how many of you have ever read like the old original King James version of the Bible? Okay, many of you have because you grew up in church, right? Because if you if you did if if you've read the original King James version of the Bible, and when I say original, I'm talking about that was revised from the 1611 and 1609. I mean, you you wouldn't have read that, I don't think, because the language and the, I mean, they spell music M U S I C K and uh, ye old this and ye old. I mean, if you've ever read the quote real original version, I have one page by the way of an original King James version of the Bible. I matter it's, is that hanging in the for you're out there, uh, Isaiah 43, where it is, it's right there. There it is, Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19 in the original 1609, original English. Read it when you get ready to leave today. See if you can. It's like another language almost, really. It's just amazing. But anyway, the original King James said, uses the word here, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory is what it says. Let nothing be done through strife. What does strife mean? Strive means to fight, right? If I'm, if I'm striving with someone, I'm fighting with them. And so Paul says, all right, the first thing that we have to do if we're going to be at peace and we're not going to have conflict is we're going to have to defuse the competition in, in our life. We're going to have to stop fighting for superiority because that's what we fight for. As a matter of fact... The book of James, and you know, you've heard me, we've been in James before in different things. James is just really straightforward, and he just doesn't pull any punches. If you're a really straightforward person, and you like it just, you know, you say, tell me like it is, preacher. Well, read the book of James. And put your steel toes on, because he's going to get those feet. He's going to get those toes on you, I'm going to tell you. But he says in chapter 4, now listen, he's writing the book of James to a church. That's another thing you have to remember when you read the book. The book's written to a church, not to a bunch of heathen outlaws. I mean, he's writing to the body of Christ, to a church of believers. And in chapter 4, he says, hey, uh, where do those wars and fightings come from that uh, war in your members? Now, you mean churches fight? Churches war? Churches have strife in them? Have you been, now don't raise your hand because I'm not really asking for a testimony. It's just rhetorical. But have you ever been in a church that fights and wars and quarrels? And yes. da, da, da. Well, he says, where does that come from? And then he says this, doesn't it come from the lust that wars in your members? In other words, doesn't, doesn't fighting and quarreling and warring come from the desires that every member has in their own heart about things? You have a desire. I have a desire. Billy has a desire. Brian has a desire. We all have competing desires, and we want our desires taken care of, and so we try to get our desire. He says, you want. Now, this is all still in the same first verse. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Come they not of, the, of lust that wars in your members? He says, you want and you have not. It's one thing not to want anything, but it's another thing to want something and not be able to get it. And that's what starts fightings and wars, uh, quarrels and wars and the, 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 the strife for superiority. 
is I have stuff I want, and so do they, and so do they, and so do they, and so we have competing desires. And so Paul says, if you're going to, if you're going to, to reduce conflict in your life, you're going to have to defuse that competitiveness in your life if you're ever going to live at peace with each other, no matter whether it's a family or a church or a government or whatever it might be, we want what we want when we want it, you know? And we have to fight that, that, that attitude in our own life. Yeah, yeah. That life's all about me and what I want and where I want to go. And then he said, you have not because you ask not. <laughs> the reason you don't have anything is because you don't ask God for anything. You fight and you war and you try to obtain, but you can't get it. And you don't have because you don't ask. And then he puts the whammy on them and he says, and even when you do ask, you don't get what you pray for. <laughs> because you, 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 you're praying selfishly that you might consume it on your own lust is what the verse says. Competing desires in life. So if I'm going to be like-minded, if I'm going to have the same love, if I'm going to be of, of one spirit, if I'm going to be of one purpose, one mind, then we have to diffuse this competition that we have in life, in a church, in a family, in a business, life, home. Second thing. All right, here we go. Here's the second thing. Second, delete conceit. Um, when we're talking about conceit, we're really talking about pride. Now, pride is an insidious thing in our life. I know that we all want to take pride in things that we do, which is fine. I mean, we all, we all want to do things with excellence, and, and, and we all want to uh, do things with value and, and so forth. So I'm not, I'm not talking about that desire to uh, produce excellence in your life. I'm talking about that, that pride that that thinks it's better than everybody else. I'm talking about that pride that wants to criticize everybody. That, cry, that, that, that pride that wants to belittle people. That wants to really say, you know, I'm just a little bit better than you are. Because when we criticize others, you know what we're, what we're saying deep in our own life? <laughs> Seriously? And we love to do it. We love to criticize. We, we, it's, it's fun. It's like a game to find something wrong with something somebody said or somebody did or you didn't do this right or you should have done this or you should have thought of that. You know what that is? That's deep within us. That's just basically an opportunity to look at somebody and say, you know, I'm just really a little bit smarter than you. And because if I would have done it, this is what I would have done. And then I criticize whatever it is you do, whatever you did. And man, with the internet today and social networks, it's almost become a team sport to criticize people, to belittle people, to put down on people. Especially, you know, you hear all the bullying and all that other kind of stuff. I mean, it, 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 it's just pride run rampant. Let me, let me just ask you this. How many of you have ever found yourself in an argument where, where after a, just a few moments of time, you realize you're wrong, but you won't admit you're wrong? You keep on arguing even though you know you're wrong. What, what does that to you? Pride. Pride, as a matter of fact, Proverbs says, where pride is, there are quarrels. So pride keeps us stirred up. Pride keeps us fighting against each other. And so what Paul is saying here in verse 3, again, do nothing out of selfish ambition uh, or vain conceit. Just pure old pride. The, the old King James word for that last is vain glory. So we're not doing things out of strife. We're not trying to compete with each other. We're not in a competition. We can't live life competing with each other. And we also don't do things out of conceit, which is basically, I know you wrote the words down when it was up on the other, personal pride. Uh, we got to fight personal pride. And so, so the Apostle Paul is trying to tell us, all right, here's what we Here's what we really need in life. We need to face each other without competition, and we need to crucify the pride in our life. What does Proverbs, I know Proverbs has another verse. It says, uh, 
uh, what does it say? It's about being, um, oh, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. You know what that's saying? People who get too big for their britches will be exposed in the end. Pride. Insidious monster of pride. Let me, let me move on. All right, here's the third one. The third one is decreased criticism. Devaluing others. Um, whenever, whenever I don't value another person, I'm going to treat them uh, with less respect than they deserve. So, Paul says in verse 4, I think it is verse 3, uh, in humility, value others above yourself. Um, let's see, what was the original language of that? Oh, it was, um, it was um, think more of others than you think of yourself or prefer others over yourself. Uh, the instruction is that in order for me to reduce conflict in my life, I have to stop thinking only about me. Now, that's what many of us, that's all we think about, is what does this mean to me? How is this going to affect me? But the Paul, but the Paul, Paul says, all right, now look, we're in a family. God's put us together. God's, God's called us together. And, and we don't want to be in conflict with each other all the time. And so, and so our, the competition's got to go. And, 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 and my pride's got to be moved out of the way. And, and now I, I'm going to have to start valuing other people. You know, it, this is really a very simple concept, isn't it, really? To value someone else above yourself. That's not difficult to understand. That's not a complicated thing. But it's such a revolutionary thing. You know why? Because we don't do it. As a matter of fact, it's the exact opposite of what we do in our lives. Our society that we live in is built for, um, for criticism and devaluing of other people, right? I mean... Uh, Back when we used to read books, there was, a, there was a book that was called Looking Out for Number One, right? You remember, anybody remember this book? Okay, you're not readers. All right. Let me just tell you that, let me just tell you that thing sold several million copies. Uh, looking Out for Number One. It was a matter of fact, it was a bestseller for a lot, a lot of, a lot of months and months and months. I mean, looking out for number one. Uh, uh, Self Magazine, you know, <laughs> what's that all about? Well, it's because we're interested in ourselves. It's because the focus of our life is all about, is about, is about ourselves. And so we're very adept at criticizing. We're very adept at looking over people. How many of you like to go out and fellowship with, uh, with a selfish jerk. I mean, this is something you look forward to. We love humble people, right? You love humble people. I, how many of you ever heard anybody say, brag about their humility? I'm, you know, the thing I'm most proud of is my humility. <laughs> no, really. No, we love humble people. And a truly humble person really is not even aware that they're humble, are they? Because they're not focused on themselves. But we've all been out with those... Um, with those conceited people, with those people that think only about themselves. Mimi birds is what I call them. Uh, no matter what you've done, me's done something better than what you've done. No matter what you say, uh, they got a, me's got a story about it. Me's done greater things, and me's more interesting. And me, uh, yeah. Paul says, no, 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 no. We, we, in, in order to live without conflict, we have to decrease the criticism in our life, and we have to look at others as being greater, and that doesn't mean superior. It just means that we at least believe that we should respect other people. They at least deserve my respect and, uh, and, and, and to allow others to have a, a, a big place in our life where we don't have to be the center of everything. Let me give you number four. Number four is demonstrate consideration. We're talking about being sensitive to other people. 
this is really just noticing people. It's really what it's about. Just paying attention to other people and noticing what it is that makes their life click, what it is they need, what it is that would bless them, what it is that would lift them. You know, in the, in the, in the book of Proverbs, the Bible says that we parents are to train up our children in the way of the Lord. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. And I've said this to you before, and I know, you know it's redundant to say it again because you remember everything I say, but, but just for maybe somebody that didn't hear this, what that verse means is that we parents are given the responsibility by God to be so observant of our children to know our children so well that when it comes time to point them in a direction for where their life should go, what they should do with their life, what kind of job they need to look, whether they need to go to college or not, uh, what direction do they need to go in, when it comes that time in, in, in our ch children's life that we ought to know them so well that we can give them advice that will bless their life. And if we can do that, train up a child in the way in which he should go, not the way you would go. So many parents don't, don't, train, don't push a child in the way the child should go. They push a child in the way they should have went or that they're sorry they didn't go. And they try to live life vicariously through their children, trying to make their children something that they always wanted to be. And God says, no, 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 no. no. What we have to do in order to live with others is we have to notice, we have to pay attention to the needs of other people. And see, we all have different needs. I guarantee you that I could take this section right here and just go every single person in this section and, and there would be different needs of every single person in this section. There would be certain things you need to receive from others. There'd be certain things you don't need to hear from others. There would be ways that you needed to be encouraged and strengthened and then other ways where would, it would completely crush your life if, if you went in that direction. That's paying attention. Now, I know we can't do that for every single person. I mean, I, I, I've done it for a lot of people in church because I'm your pastor, and God's given me a gift to do that with. But at least in your family, you should, you should know. I mean, quickly, let me, let me just ask you. Right now, just without thinking, right off the top of your head, could you tell, could you tell me the three major uh, desires of everybody in your family? Could you name one? Like, this is the one thing that my wife really loves or, or she's all about. This is one thing my husband, these are my children. These are, I mean, can you, can you, can you I don't want you to do it. I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to make a point. And the point is, do you know your family well enough that you know what their heart yearns for? That if somebody says, what is, what is your boy all about? You could say, well, he loves this and he loves this and he really lives for this. That's what that, that's what that is saying, is that, that, that we need to pay attention to others. Look at this. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. I mean, that's just pretty much straight right out of, right, right straight down the line. But you know what's wrong with us? We are so preoccupied with ourselves. Think about it. When you come home from work, guys, what do you do? You bury yourself in the TV? First place you go, you say, man, it's been a hard day. Let me get these boots off. And, you, and then the first thing, you plop down that couch, and there it is right in front of you. And you never move until your wife says, hey, honey, it's time for supper. Or get in that iPhone or whatever, Droid, whatever you got, smartphone. Your whole life's lived like this right here. The funniest thing, and I'm not talking about funny being comical, I'm talking about weird and goofy and not right, is to see a whole group of people. Have you ever seen this? A whole group of people, every one of them's got a little phone. And every one of them's sitting there in their own little phone, sitting on it like two or three of them sitting on the couch, all three of them got phone. 
and one sitting over there, they got a phone, and one sitting over there, got a phone, and, and, and yeah, and they're sitting there right there, and every one of them is, is revolving around their own little world. There used to be a time, that, you know, there used to be such a thing as conversation, where you learn how to uh, understand other people and how you learn to know what they desire and what they like and what they're all about and what rings their bell and floats their boat and all, you know. But now we're so self-absorbed that I'm telling you, we're, we're going to rear a generation that's not even going to know how to talk to each other. Yeah, I mean, good night, man. I mean, it's in an elevator, you walk in an elevator, I know it's awkward in that. See, I, I'm just... I do this all the time because my job demands I go different places. So I'm in an elevator, and I guarantee you, you get in an elevator with somebody, they won't talk to you. They'll be sitting there on that phone, and I, you know, just doing something. I don't know if there's anything on the screen or not, but it's just a way of, of avoiding, avoiding any contact. And then when you get off the elevator, you know what Oh, have a good day, sir. Yeah, you have a good day. You know, acting like, okay, we had this wonderful conversation on the way up three floors, and now you're like, hey, have a good day. And I'm going, what in the world? You, you didn't say a word. You were all self-involved with that phone. What do you want me to have a good day? You know, I mean, it's just such a crazy, selfish world that we live in. You get your day off, and I'm talking to the guys because I am a guy, but ladies, you just apply this to yourself. I mean, you get this day, you get a day off Saturday. You come home, you say, "Man, I'm so tired. I've been working all week, and it's just been man, my job just killing me. And I need, I need some rest and some relaxation, and I deserve it because I've earned it because I've worked all week." And you head out to the golf course, and your wife hadn't had a time away from the kids in three weeks. I mean, you, but you deserve it. What about her? Does she deserve something? See, that's that's what we're talking about. We're talking about the needs of others, that I am observant of the needs of others. That's what we're talking about, that I pay attention. Yeah, that I pay attention. Don't be talking, Brother Charles. He needs every word of this. <laughs> that I pay attention to what's going on here in life. Um, I tell you what, I said this one time, and, and uh, I was so... I found it in my notes the other day when I was looking at some of this stuff, and I thought, oh, my goodness, man, that's where that, that thought came from. Um, when, your wife looks at you and says, why didn't you call me and let me know that you were going to be late for dinner? I had it ready like an hour ago because that's when you're usually home. Why didn't you call me and let me know? Men, here's what you say to her. I'm sorry, honey, but I was only thinking of myself. And when she regains consciousness, <laughs> you look at her and say, next time I'll be more considerate. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about paying attention to other people's needs, not just thinking about yourself. Reduces conflict in life. I tell you, there's a real benefit to that, to, to, to being uh, observant about that. Because if you'll do it for others, they'll do it for you. Let me tell you, I heard a church family. Um, this happened uh, a few weeks ago. A uh, husband was gone away, and... Uh, Yard got in a mess, pretty much. You know, it needed to be cut. It had different, uh, you know, debris and stuff on it. And, you know, like normally happens with a family, with the kids taking stuff outside and eating and you know, pieces of paper. And, uh, and then the wind blows and there's some twigs and limbs and leaves. And then the grass needs to be cut. Anyway, just like every, all of our yards nor normally do. But Dad was gone and couldn't take care of it. And so he was coming home this day. And he was one of those kind of dads that was real considerate of his family. And I'm just saying this to show you that there's a benefit to this, to, to, to paying attention to other people's needs because they'll pay attention to yours. And so uh, we were, we were with, with his wife, and, uh, and she said, I need to hurry up and get home and get the kids home so they can get that yard cleaned up 
because when dad gets home, we want the yard clean because if, if he sees it dirty, then he'll get out there and start cleaning it up himself. In other words, compassionate about somebody else's ability to rest and relax because they're always giving to the family. And I'm just saying that things like that are important and they keep conflict out of our life. Let me just give you this one, one other one. He says one other thing. Now, it covers a, a several verses, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to be real quick with this. Develop Christ-likeness. The reason why we have conflict in life many times is because we go around without Christ. Now, I know that almost everybody in this building. I, I mean, I'm not the Holy Spirit, and I'm not God, so I don't know exactly who knows the Lord in this building or not. I would think that most of you do, just by your actions and, and, and by the things that I've observed about you. I would think that, yes, you, you are a Christian, and you do know the Lord. But in our Christian life, God intends for something to happen to us. And that is that we would grow more and more and more like Jesus. God does not intend for us to come to Christ and ask him to save our soul, to live in our life, and then nothing else happened to us. So the reason why conflict happens in many situations is because we got a bunch of people going around without Jesus in their life. And so the fifth conflict reducer would be, I need to get the Lord in my life. And if I have him in my life and I'm not letting him reflect out of my life, I need to make a priority to let the Lord work out of my life. And to start living a life that exemplifies Christ rather than, than, just, than just me. And he says this in these next three, four verses. Five, in your relationships with one another. Look at this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Now, what he's saying there is use Jesus as an example. Now, Jesus reduced conflict everywhere he went, even with people that didn't want to reduce conflict with him. He had, he had to handle people that were literally hostile to him. So if you want to know how to handle people that are hostile to you and people that are, that are coming against you and people that have attitudes and all of that, he said, take Jesus as an example. I'm holding up Jesus and saying, look at Jesus and see what Jesus would do. You know, like that bracelet, what, WWJD, what would Jesus do? I know that a lot of times people say, oh, you know, they kind of mock that a little bit nowadays because it seems such like such a corny deal. But I'm just saying to you, that's what the Bible says, do. In, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. What kind of mindset did Jesus have? Who, being in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. In other words, Jesus didn't take advantage of the fact that he was God while he was here on earth. That while he was here on earth, he submitted himself to his heavenly father just like he asked you to submit yourself to God. Jesus didn't pull rank on us, in other words. Jesus went through it just like we have to go through it. So when you're, when you're, when you're, having, when you're in relationship with someone else, look at what Jesus did. He's our example. And he didn't demand special privileges and he didn't demand special rights. He went through the same stuff we went through just like we're going to have to go through. Number, verse 7, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Jesus chose to be a servant to us. Now, I know you may be thinking, well, how do I know if I'm a servant? Well, it's very easy. How do you act when somebody treats you like a servant? When somebody just expects certain things and treat, I mean, what's your attitude? They're not going to treat me like that. No, Jesus said, all right, that's the kind of mindset Jesus had. Jesus said, all right, I'm a servant. And that's what I'm going to be. And when people treat me like a servant, that's fine because that's what I'm going to be. 
Then verse 8, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Jesus was willing to sacrifice himself for other people. Us. We have life with Christ because Jesus gave himself, not because somebody overpowered him, not because somebody took it from him. As a matter of fact, the next verse, verse 9 says, And for this cause God has given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess to the glory of God the Father. In other words, because Jesus humbled himself, God gave him a name that's above every name. You would think, okay, Jesus died on the cross. Jesus lost it all. No, he didn't lose it all. He got it all when he died on the cross because through his death, he, God gave him a name that every knee's going to bow before one day. Now, see, I know thinking about these kind of things, you know, deleting the competition in our life and conceit in our life and criticism in our life and, and trying to think of others more than yourself and all that. You may be saying, man, you know, goodness, that's a, I mean, that's a big task right there. That's a, may I just say, I'm a long, my life's a long way from that. Well, I understand it's a long way from that. Because that's not the way we are. The way we are is to be selfish and self-centered and self-focused and to look out for number one. I mean, if the book had been written looking, uh, looking out for everybody else, I guarantee you it wouldn't have been on a best-selling list for nothing, for no weeks, for no amount of weeks of life. Looking out for number one is what we're about. It's what humanity is about. It's the nature that we're born with. It's the nature that our society says is important, and that's what we should be. If you don't look out for yourself, nobody's going to look out for you. And so everything about our life pushes us in the exact opposite direction of where God says our life is to be if, our life is going to, if we're going to live our life in a way that's going to be enjoyable for us without this competition and all this confusion and all of this criticism. And you say, man, I'm a long way from that. Well, I know, I, and, and so are all of us, but, but that's where God comes in. God says, hey, look, give yourself to me. That's, where I, that's what I specialize in. The good news is, the bad news is, uh, pff, I can't live like that. The good news is, uh, I know you can't live like that, but that's why Christ lives in you, because Christ can live like that. Because God can, can give you a spirit to live like that. Because he can empower you to live like that. That's what Christianity is all about. And it's not a matter, in that last little note down there you might read, uh, it's not a matter of imitation. It's not a matter of trying to act like Jesus. It's a matter of habitation. Where we allow him to inhabit our life. And for him to live his life through us. That's what Christianity is. Is Jesus living his life through us. And he can do that. And he can, and he can take your life. And he can move inside of you. If you'll just say yes to him. Why, why don't you just, if you will, stand to your feet.